Okay, well, this is very stimulating so far. So I'm going to talk about uh, biostatistics and what biostatistics can contribute to this larger discussion. Okay, so I call this data science and human health. Uh, and I am uh, chief of the division of biostatistics and bioinformatics that's in the Department of Family and Preventive Medicine at the School of Medicine. So I'd like to just briefly tell you who we are. We have 11 biostatistics faculty at UCSD. We provide the biostatistics effort across the School of Medicine. That includes uh, large data cores at Moore's Cancer Center. I happen to run that one at uh, CTRI. So if you go to CTRI, that's us. Uh, big research groups in Alzheimer's disease, in public health research, in HIV AIDS, in traumatic brain injury, in stroke, et cetera, et cetera. We deal with uh, the clinical populations. That's where we live. Um, we actively solicit collaborative projects, so I'm doing that right now. There's our website, thank you. Um, and what we do, and here I wanted to put up some great examples of our science. We have great graphs, but I have no time, so I'm not going to. I'm just going to boringly list them. Geospatial maps of risky HIV behavior, high-throughput chemical screens, that's something I've got some innovative projects in. FMRA images, I like this one, of brain activity and caffeine. So what happens to your brain when you drink caffeine? That's very interesting. Genome-wide scans for tumor mutations, and we have an expert in our audience on that uh, as well, Kelly Frazier. Accelerometer reading of physical activity, so a physical activity intervention where they chip you with all kinds of stuff. You know, it records your every move, and you wear a camera so they see what you eat. That um, creates reams of data, and they're very interesting computer science interfaces there. Prediction models for Alzheimer's onset, cancer onset, metabolomic biomarkers of disease. Okay, I better get, get on with it. So what's the problem I want to address? The big data problem, and I think we're all familiar with that. Big data is everywhere. Fortunately, at UCSD, there are lots of smart uh, postdocs and predocs everywhere, and they are analyzing big data. Um, one issue that I think we're increasingly aware of is that big data is big opportunity for false positives. The bigger your data set, the smaller your sample size, the more likely you are to find an interesting result. And here's my uh, diplomatic way of putting it. As the field matures, better methodology may be called for. Um, but please don't just take my word for it. Uh, this is increasingly becoming an issue in the biomedical literature. So here's a recent editorial from Nature Methods from September that says, Sound experimental design and analysis require improved statistical training. Concerns about data quality and reproducibility have been rising. Basic training in experimental design and statistics needs to be more broadly disseminated. New statistical reporting and review standards have been announced across the nature journals. And I think this may have a big impact on the way data analyses are presented going forward. Uh, related initiatives at NSF and NIH, there's a new SAMHSA Institute at NSF for this year called Beyond Bioinformatics, Statistical and Mathematical Challenges that are trying to sort of increase the quality of the analysis that goes on. So here's my schematic of Beyond Bioinformatics. Computer science, mathematics, probability, and statistics, these are the theoretical disciplines. Then there's applied methods. Then there's science and research in the clinic. And I should have put the clinic down there. So this computer science, correct algorithms, mathematics, linear algebra, the basic, basic tools, probability and statistics, statistical significance, p-values, that's the theory. Applied methods, that's where, that's where biostatisticians live. And then software and tools for end users. This is what uh, the postdocs use. They are brilliant at scanning what's out there, picking up tools, and using them. What we're trying to do is increase the pipeline flow from the theoretical rigor up there to the application of tools down in the clinic. That's the big picture. Why statistics? Why do I put statistics at the center of all of that? Because it's the science of learning from data and of measuring, controlling, and communicating uncertainty. That's what we're good at. That's why no one really likes statisticians. <laughs> so we tell you what's not there. Statistical methods produce efficient, 
rigorous, correct inference instead of ad hoc methods. If the signal is big, ad hoc does fine. But if it's a little more subtle, ad hoc doesn't do so well. And especially if you're in the big data setting, ad hoc tends to be optimistic. Another reason maybe people don't like statisticians so well. But uh, if we say it's there, it's probably there. OK, so the proposed joint project specifically is a training and research pipeline in biostatistics. We've lined up participating faculty, 11 from biostats, four from math. There's a very good math stats group. So far, two from computer science and engineering in the data mining space, efficient algorithms space. But there are others, so we're just reaching out. There's a good group at econometrics, and then psychology can contribute this item response theory. So there are various sort of data science players across campus that we're reaching out to. OK, and then this is our proposal. We have initiatives going to put in an undergraduate major, an interdepartmental PhD program, and postgraduate training. So there are opportunities in all three of these areas that we're pursuing. Um, key facts, the, the idea is that this would impact quantitative research and training broadly across campus. I mean, the vision is an army of PhD students in biostatistics looking for applied projects on which to do their theses with these theoretical faculty backing them up behind them. That's the vision. There's a high demand, few biostatistics training programs in California. The undergraduate major is very rare. I think so far there's only two undergraduate majors. I have to stop. And uh, we are uniquely, uniquely qualified at UCSD for this because of our, the strength of our, our faculty here. So I'll, I'll stop there and say thank you. Any questions? Are the two uh, undergraduate programs, are those UC-wide or nation, nationwide? I, well, I think that's nationwide so far. It's very, very rare. Karen, I, I think you already started our conversation. Excellent. I think you and I really have to sit together, together with our colleagues. Excellent. Uh, I think several items I would have added the word engineering quite comfortably. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, I think the improvements will come both with better methods, and especially new methods. Yes. We're talking about, you know, here at UCSD, we have now a major breakthrough in glucose sensing that was just oh. possible in the past. We will be able to get reams of data that have never been possible in the past. So there are multiple levels at which we will be able to interact. And what I wanted, when I saw your talk, I thought I should have put a lot more of the clinical importance in here because our, right. our, we are comfortable with the FDA. We are comfortable with the basic medical journals. That's the area in which we live in, clinical trial design. That's our bread and butter. So we're really down in the translational trenches. And I, I think that's what we have to offer. Here again, I, I think, uh, you know, uh, if you, within the sciences, for example, we've made big investments in quantitative biology. There's a proposal going forward for a graduate program. Those students are all going to need this. But I want to take this even for, uh, into the social sciences. So we're developing now many, uh, along the lines of what we're doing in sciences and engineering, of iterative experiments, collecting field data, bringing it back and then changing that to affect policies uh, that are based on, you know, uh, hard numbers. And all of those individuals also need the statistics training. So I think the need is, is going to be ever increasing. I think. And, I, and I think those, those problems are fascinating too. You know, we work a lot in the tobacco policy arena, for example, or behavioral intervention trials, which are similar. And then our economics colleagues, we have a lot of commonalities. Just so real quick, so um, one of the things I noticed in, in, in people presenting bioinformatics sort of talks is the need for better visualization of results. Like uh, we have these massive data sets, you know, like um, you know microbiome or you know or genetics and stuff. It's very hard to think about it. Yeah, you know, I was very impressed that you need to develop new tools. I don't know if this is in your. Absolutely, we're we're really good. 
one of the things we do well is take a big bunch of information and, and draw plots, draw graphs. That's kind of our core approach. Big data set and we, we end up drawing line graphs or bar charts or distilling the information in a way that's both rigorous and digestible. Yes, it, and the other person we want to reach out to are people in the video image processing um, arena in computer science. So I've just started looking there. So that's, that's kind of the other aspect of looking at really high dimensional data clouds. How do you, how do you visualize data in high dimensions? That's kind of a whole nother problem.